Let's pray. Amen. Amen. Lord, Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your beautiful will for each and every person in this room, Lord. And I pray and I believe and I trust and I know that we're going to see that come to pass, Lord. Because when you begin something, you finish it. You don't quit. You don't get discouraged. You don't get down. You don't look back. You keep pressing. You keep going. You keep believing until the job is done. You put it all on the line, even your very life. So I know you're committed, committed beyond our human comprehension to the healing and the deliverance and the Christ ordained destiny for each individual here. Lord, you are committed. Like, I pray that sinks in right now. Yes, God. Like, you keep going. You keep pressing in. You may be bloodied. You may be battered. But you keep giving every last drop, every last yes, ounce. You give so that we could live. And we, we, we praise you. We lift up the mighty name of Jesus. We lift you up. Without you, none of this would be possible. We lift you up over our lives and over our families and over this ministry and over this class today. We lift you up in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. How's everybody doing today? Great. Thought this day would never come. <laughs> I've been itching to do the training, so hopefully it goes well. I... Uh, I first got exposed to deliverance in 2007. And so that's 17 years. Seems doesn't seem like it's been that long. It seems kind of hard to believe. And I, I guess I could say I'm fascinated with it. And so I've thought about it. I've been in different churches where it wasn't so well received. And I've been a leader in those churches. So you're kind of stuck between the Deliverance Center and Brother Mike and his unique <laughs> approach to ministry, which is like cut of the same cloth of maybe John the Baptist or somebody like that, you know? So I know if you're wondering what to get Brother Mike for Christmas, get him locust. He, was, <laughs> he, was, he would like those. And so, and then in the church where it's like polished, clean, if there is any deliverance, it's uh, you got to come on Tuesday night and park in the back by the alley and make sure no one sees you. It's, it's, um, um, can I get agreement with that? You know, right? So you're, I was kind of stuck in between there and I felt like I, maybe between two parents, right? If they get divorced and like, I don't have a home. Don't want to marry this thing. Come on, mom and dad. Come on, church, get back together. And uh, so my point is that I've, I've thought about it a lot and I've kind of searched it, searched understanding and searched balance and searched, you know, you, you get challenged in it, right? How many know when you get into deliverance and then things get a little dry, you, maybe you're not getting the success, maybe you're, it, you know, and then you're, the enemy can start kind of nipping at your heels a little bit and getting in your crawl like, hey, you know, maybe you're going too far. Maybe this isn't all, you know, you know, come on now, come on. Don't just make me look like an idiot. Come on, let's go down together. And so, but that's not a bad thing. Because you, when you're challenging something, you got to look at it. You got to look in the mirror. You got to examine it. I, I want to check my assumptions. And if you want to get through deliverance and you want to get delivered, you got to check some assumptions. You know, you can't just say, oh, something ain't going right and it, and it ain't me. Like, okay, maybe it's me. Maybe I, maybe I need to go back to the drawing board. Maybe it's something I missed. So I'm always, I think that's one of maybe my strengths is that I don't, I don't care who gets it right as long as we get it right. I don't care who is right. or I don't care if I'm right or if I'm wrong. I care that we get it right. And, and if you're married, that's a great approach. And in life, that's a great approach. And if you want to be free, that's a great approach. I don't care. I mean, was it a raven that fed Elijah? Right. So that's an unclean bird. The dirty birds. You know, 
he had enough humility to allow himself to be fed by a dirty bird. So God will speak and move in unusual circumstances and situations, but if you have your mind made up at how it should be and where you're at and who's in and who's out and who's anointed and who's not, you're going to miss something. Amen. And on a journey, starting to preach a little bit, on a journey, think of a long journey, how many turns and things that you need to line up to get from point A to point B. To drive to like New York City. How many, if you miss one turn, besides that annoying, rerouting, rerouting, rerouting. <laughs> the, at least they updated it. It's not as annoying as it used to be. But if you miss one turn, you can, that, so I want to check my assumptions. I don't want to assume like I got it all figured out. I'm not afraid to be challenged in it. And I say all that to say, like, I felt like I've, I feel like I've put in an ample amount of time searching the scriptures, uh, seeking insight, and, and what I have today is I want to share with you is from birth out of that is first a couple of concepts that I feel like are very, very helpful, a couple of concepts about deliverance, and then some best practices, okay? So I'm calling this Deliverance 101, so my first question for you guys is, what is deliverance? Okay, this is the elementary level. Okay, all right. We got, don't take that personal. I'm just, you got to have fun. Come on, it's okay. You can laugh at yourself, right? You want to get delivered? Laugh at yourself, all right? If you can't laugh at yourself, you're not going to get delivered as much as you want. I'm just telling you that right now. What is deliverance? Can somebody chime in? Being set free. Being set free. Anyone else? Breaking down strongholds. Strongholds, yes. Exchanging a lie for, for truth. Exchanging lies for truth, yes. Renewing your mind, yes. Anyone else? It's the children's bread. Yes. Anyone else? Mindset. It's a mindset. My first concept is this. Deliverance is a destination. It's not getting delivered from. It's getting delivered to. We talked about in the little prayer meeting that desperate people want to be delivered. Why? because they want to deal with whatever issue is hindering them. Addiction, lust, whatever. And the essence of it is, I want to get rid of this. That's why we want deliverance. I was mentally ill. I didn't want to be mentally ill. Being mentally ill is no fun. Get me out of mental illness, right? All right, so. You can say yes, okay? Come on, interact with me now. Come on, this is a group thing. Don't be shy. You raise your hand. So, if I get delivered from mental illness, what do I do? What's next? I'm just going to get rid of uh, insomnia and delusions and hallucinations and delusions of grandeur and the big dose of stupidity that goes with it. What is, so, what's next? Yeah, but so that's the thing. So, so the point is, what's the goal? What's the destination? I want to get delivered from mental illness. I have to have a target, a goal. In deliverance ministry, we have to have a goal of where we're going, of where we're trying to get people to. It's not just getting rid of addiction. It's not just getting rid of mental illness. It's getting to who you are called to be in Christ. Yes. I was going to say the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ. So. So my concept, and I feel like this is important, and it is deliverance is not just getting delivered from, it's getting delivered to. And if we're not careful, we just focus on getting out of or rid of whatever it is that we don't like. But that's, but where are you going? Where are they going? 
So the children of Israel is the best example. They, were, they cried out for several hundred years for deliverance. And God rose up a deliverer. And it wasn't just about getting out of Egypt. What was it about? Going to the psalmist. Yeah, and God told him. He told him time and again. He said, I'm going to show you a land flowing with milk and honey. I'm going to whet your appetite. Guys, it's just not about getting out of Egypt. It's about where we're going. Yes. I was just going to say that I also feel like um, these spirits hinder our relationship with the Lord. They're trying to pull us from the Lord. They're trying to pull us back into sin. We allow it. And so having the freedom and having the joy and the peace of the Lord is like priceless and drawing close to the Lord. And, and so being free of those things that want to draw us back, you're not mm -hmm. so susceptible. You're That's exactly it. So think of the difference of someone, I just got delivered from Egypt. I'm no longer a slave in Egypt. I'm no longer being ruled and reigned by a taskmaster. Okay? That was good for about six weeks. <laughs> and then they started getting antsy. And, okay, well, the food out here stinks, and, you know, I, I, I don't have this person, I don't have this person. They started grumbling. Within a year, they, it was, God was like, that's it, you're done. Why? Because they were focused on where they were getting delivered from. They weren't focused on where they were going to. And so it, it, that is the mindset that we have to have and we have to instill within people. It's not just getting rid of X, Y, Z. It's getting to where God has called you. Yeah. Because if I get through the wilderness, which is essential... I have to go through the wilderness. I have to be in those uncomfortable situations where those things that are inconsistent with God and His character can be brought to the surface so that I can deal with them. Like the wilderness is essential. But if I get through that and I get to that promised land and now I'm enjoying that milk and the honey, like Sister said, I'm enjoying the, the intimacy with Christ. I'm enjoying the peace that comes from God. I'm, I'm enjoying all those fruits, all that benefit that comes from that relationship with Christ. I am so much more less likely to go back. True. And that's the real prize. And I, we're kind of, let's just be real, we're kind of self-serving and selfish if we just take approach to deliverance. I want to get rid of the ugly parts of me. It's not about that. It's about us being in a restored, right fellowship and relationship with the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, the same thing that was lost in the garden. That's, that's, that's what we're going for. And those things, the lies, the fears, the worldly ideas, the false gods, the hang-ups, the rejection, the bitterness, all those things are things that hinder us from having that relationship, that fellowship with Christ. Amen? Amen. And then when we, when we get to that place and we become married with who He is and who we are in Him and we have been able to get rid of all those other influences, that's, that's going to be hard to beat. But if I'm just focused, if people are just focused, just get me out of hell. Get me out of jail. And you, and, and you have people, that's their mindset. Get me out of jail. I just want to be out of jail. Can I help you today? I want to be out of jail. Well, duh. You know, and then they get out of jail and they stay straight for like a week and then adversity comes and they go do something stupid again and they, half the time they end up back in jail. Because it wasn't enough just to get out of jail. It's not just enough to get delivered. Where are you going to? Where are they going to? And as a deliverance minister, you need to point them in those directions. Like, what are you called to do? What are your passions? What are your desires? What are your God-given dreams? What are your goals for your life? Look back, reflect, think about things that you've wanted to do or always wanted to do. Like if you ever want to write a book, you ever want to start a, a business or have a family or, you know, it doesn't have to be spiritual in nature necessarily to do something for God. He says, let all that you do be done for the Lord. Amen. So I can balance my checking account for God. Amen. 
So if we don't have in our minds the concept of getting delivered to, we can short circuit the process. We can leave them ill-equipped. Classic example is, oh, I don't want to be an addict anymore. I don't want to be on drugs. They're so, they're, 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 that's the enemy, the drug, the addiction. And they run to overeating. The spirits just switched their, switched their focus. So it was, I, wanna, I just want to stop doing drugs. Great. Awesome. We can do that. God can do that. But where are you trying to go? Does that help? Yes. Um, another thing I was thinking while you talk about that is, you know, we have to change our old habits and break those old habits off. But you also have to create new habits in order to um, move forward. And that's the essence of it, right? That's... <laughs> We're talking about getting delivered from, getting delivered to. And the last example I said is somebody struggling with addiction. Hey, I just want to stop doing drugs. I want to stop doing drugs. Well, what is that going to look like? Right? What is that? Well, how, how does that look? And we see Egypt went, the children of Israel went out of Egypt into uh, the promised land. And the way I look at it, there's two kingdoms. And you have darkness. And you have light. And to get delivered is to be transferred from darkness to light. And full deliverance is each and every part of your, of your body, your thinking, your personality. I love, I, I saw Brother Mike tell a guy one time, he says, he says, you've never met yourself. Because his personality was so influenced by the kingdom of darkness. Right? In darkness, if you have the sun, the darkness blocks the light. And we know everything needs light to grow. You need the light, right? There's plants and things. And darkness and, you know, bad weather and someone is here. And it says, I think it's Colossians 1.23, where he's delivered us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. It's not just about where God brought us from, but it's where he's bringing us to. What if there was no heaven? What if there was no heaven? Obviously there is. Don't, don't give me too many weird looks, but... So I'm just going to get you saved and we're just going to leave you wandering earth and then you're going to die. And No, there's a destination. There's a goal. There's a point. There's an end. The same should be true with deliverance. One thirteen. he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. This, this is deliverance this it's not just getting out of this it's not just stop sinning it's what does it look like now how do you respond to adversity now what are your habits now what do you think of yourself now what do you think of God now it should be different it should no longer be obscured it should be influenced. There should be clarity. When someone gets delivered, they, they see better. They think better. I don't want to just get rid of these negative thoughts. I want clarity. I want understanding. I want insight. I want godly wisdom. This person over here can't, is their own worst enemy. Ah, oh, they're harder than themselves and beating themselves up. And ah, oh, it's, it's always my fault. Why did I do that? I'm so dumb. Blah, 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 blah. 
How many have ever been around someone like that? It's kind of comical. It's like, oh my goodness. I don't think I ever met your dad, but I'm pretty sure I know what he talks like. No, I, I want to stop being in it. No, I want wisdom. I want wisdom. Oh, I always make the wrong choice. No, I want wisdom. I want clarity. I want, um, someone said freedom. So when you're leading someone through deliverance, paint a picture of what that could look like. I had insomnia. Boy, that's, that's torturous. Insomnia? You know what the one thing the enemy would do is that sit around and do nothing all day. And then at 10 o'clock at night, I got so inspired and I was ready to change the world. And then I, after a little while of that, I was like, ah, oh, that's the devil. Yep, that's the devil. Because if it was God, I think it would happen maybe 10 a.m. Where I had a chance to do something about it and stores were open. Not at 10 p.m. when the lights are off. <laughs> People are sleeping in your house. It's not a good time to go work out or go for a jog. Especially in Arizona. <laughs> right? It's getting delivered too. I had, I had insomnia. God gives his beloved rest. I still remember that piece of paper. Brother Mike took out a piece of scrap paper and didn't have this big fancy building. Fancy? Yeah, it's fancy. And he writes down a few verses. God gives his beloved rest. I want to fall asleep. I want to fall asleep. I want to, I want to get rid of insomnia. No. You want rest. You want self-control. I want to stop. I got to stop doing this. I got to, I, I get so upset. I get sorry. I'm going to say all this dumb stuff. No. There's the target. Is this helping? Yes. That's the first concept I really want to talk about. Any, any comments? Any questions? No. Half a comment. You kind of went halfway there. <laughs> come on. Come on. Jump in here, sister. Any comments? Any questions? David, that is a good thing to ask somebody right off the bat. What is your goal? Is it to serve the Lord? Because I have had problems with people that just wanted to get free and they had no ambition to serve the Lord and they never really got anything for the Lord. Well, it's like the Dead Sea analogy, right? Like, I, God wants me to be delivered so I can deliver somebody else. He wants, that's how this whole thing works. He said, okay, guys, the 12 disciples, right? And he said, I'm going to show you, and then what's the Great Commission? You go and you teach and you train and you do what I did, and then they'll know, and then they'll know. And the fact that we're standing here is because of that, right? Well, someone mentioned Derek Prince earlier, and Brother Mike is the reason I'm here, and so on and so forth. The, that's how it works. Uh, the Lord told Peter, he said, when you return to me, strengthen the brethren. Don't just, okay, you repent, you're back in my good graces. No, there's a destiny. There's a destination. So we're supposed to take it. And I, I thank God now that I had the experiences that I had going through mental illness. I wouldn't wish it on anybody. It's a nightmarish hell. I wouldn't wish it on anybody. But I'm thankful now because I'm able to help a lot of people. I'm able to minister to a lot of people and we have different backgrounds and experiences and it's so we can get here and yeah what's the next step we could keep going is to pass it on. Don't stop and hold it for yourself because that's a selfish thing to do. Freely received, freely give. And the whole thing is to 
pass it on and continue that life-giving ministry. Yes? Uh, in my reason, um, I'm a pastor in Mexico, and I was passing a lot of people that use a lot of witchcraft. Mm -hmm. So I didn't believe in that because we know that we carry with the Holy Spirit, so I didn't believe those things. But I ended up really sick in my legs, mm -hmm. in my arm, and a lot of things. Then I find out that my ex-husband, girlfriend, it was using witchcraft on me. So my goal is I have another lady to open a church over here, you know, bilingual. She's from Iran, but she become Christian, mm -hmm. and it's going to be bilingual. And I want to learn. And in case we open the church again, so to, you know, to help these people to be delivered. That's my goal. Yeah, you know. yeah, and that's good. And and that is that is the whole thing when Jesus told his disciples, "Look up." We get in our own little worlds, and it's just about. I'm tired of this and that. You know, I'm tired of financial curse. I'm tired of, you know, being alone. I'm tired of, like, look up. There's more. See, the thing about the darkness is it, it obscures the light. And when there's, the darkness is removed, you can see. When the, but the thing is, the sun's always shining. You know, when you go on a plane and you go up and the clouds are actually pretty beautiful. But if you live in upstate New York where it's overcast 255 days a year, it looks ugly. I don't like gray. Everyone likes gray. I grew up with enough gray for six lifetimes. Speaking in jest. But underneath, ugly. Above, beautiful. But the thing is, the light is always on. The sun is always shining, even at night, unless you think the world's flat, so <laughs> couldn't help myself. There's still people out there like that. Don't say the world's flat and say you're a Christian. You're making us look like idiots. That's my PSA announcement. <laughs> but when you go through deliverance and you know what's on the other side, even though a cloud shows up in your day, you have the faith. To see beyond your circumstances, to know what God can be doing. It's about that transformation of your mind. It's about seeing the end from the beginning. It's about knowing what's going to come around the corner. It's, it's a matter of perspective. It's a matter of training people how to think and see and look at life in a way that is outside of the norm. Where we're super glued to the present. Like when you train someone to, to look further, to look beyond, to look around the horizon, don't just stare at the mountain and fight the mountain, fight towards the victory. And when you train someone to do that, when adversity comes, they're already trained to fight towards the victory. Amen. Instead of getting discouraged, I thought I got rid of this black cloud. Well, yeah, but... It's going to rain sooner or later. It rains on the just and the unjust. The sun shines on the righteous. You're, you're not immune from that. But if you train someone properly, they're like, it's okay. We got over this mountain before. We can get over this mountain again. Amen? Amen. Something is not delivered till it makes it to its destination. Until then, it's only in transit. I have a thought on this. Yes. <clears throat> when I was going through my deliverance, um, there was points where I get really frustrated because it wasn't happening at the time that I wanted it to. And I felt like I was doing everything, checking all these boxes. And that's kind of how my mind works, right? Check the box and it equals this. But that's not how it worked. And um, what I found useful was a moment where I got some clarity and the Lord said, stop looking at yourself why don't you help somebody else right. and i wasn't you know mentally ill or you know struggling in that way so i could still use my mind and i felt that you know when i did that shift that actually started helping my deliverance because i was a very selfish person too in my life 
So just a thought, you know, it can help somebody redirect, stop looking at you all the time, right? Help mm -hmm. somebody else. And, you can, and let's face it, if you're only focused on yourself, you can't get delivered. Amen. Amen. Yeah. The biggest blocker for you getting delivered is... So when I, t when I work with people, I talk, I talk about goals. And I, I, what are your God-given dreams and desires, and what's a reasonable time frame to start knocking those off? Because that's what a mentor did to me. So um, is what are your God-given desires, your goals, your God-given dreams? And then pray on it, meditate on it, seek the Lord, uh, reflect. Don't chisel it in stone, be flexible. But then put those to time frames, timelines. You know, and it could be owning a home, starting a business. It doesn't have to be 100% all spiritual because whatever you do, do unto the Lord, right? So everything can be spiritual and give glory to God, right? Like if you're the first one in your family to own a home or graduate college, that can give glory to God, right? So it, it can be all encompassing ministry, family. Uh, physical fitness, whatever. And one year, two year, five, 10, 20, okay? Buying a home might take five or 10 years, right? And then you flip the script and then you say, what can I do today, this week, this month, this quarter to reach those goals, okay? Now I'm being intentional. I have the end in mind. And instead of it being just some far off hypothetical dream that seems out of reach and I have no money and actually I owe money. I have negative money. I just filed for bankruptcy. How could I ever afford a home? And, and we play on our phones and we hang out with the kids and <laughs> go camping and go to church and another week is another month and it's another year and we're nowhere closer to, to this because we didn't put it down into a bite size. Like, what's one thing I can do today? The intentional living guy on the radio, right? What's one thing that you can do to change that relationship? What's one thing that I can do today? I'm gonna pack my lunch and I'm gonna save, I was gonna say five, no, not 10. Now it's 15 bucks to go to lunch, praise the Lord. So, <laughs> remember, Brother Mike is retired, so remember that when you're giving your tithe. Man's got to eat. Um, I can say that's $10. I'm not going to be able to buy a house, but I'm one brick closer. And what, what you're doing over the long run, it took me a while to realize this, is you're reprogramming how your mind thinks. Remember, I was mentally ill. I couldn't string together sentences. Think about that for a second. This is a miracle. This is, this is a God thing. And having goals and having structure and putting structure into your day and into your life and being methodical is going to bring structure and steps and order to your mind. Instead of all of these other influences, it's about getting delivered to. What's the goal? What's the end? Amen. I think I beat that like a dead horse. Amen. Are we good? Any other thoughts on that first concept? Yes, ma'am. Um, I think that's also biblical because the, the word also says, you know, that he keeps us accountable for what we do with our with our time, our money, our our life. Yes. And uh, that's also something that the Lord has been speaking to me yeah. for this week. Yeah. And don't don't be it's a good opportunity also to fight legalism. Fight legalism. Amen. I uh I felt like God was calling me to write a book. This was probably eight years ago. I was going to the Fourth Ave jail, Kelly. And I had that ministry guy. He was a real, he was a real, uh, uh, he was like a wet blanket <laughs> to the Holy Spirit. And so anyways, he ends up turning in his badge and uh, 
just over silly stuff. And uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a God thing. The devil swept him out of there. He had actually had a sweet ministry. And if he could have, if he could have trusted and followed, he'd probably still be doing that. And he'd have probably an ample amount of treasure in heaven. But he got distracted. He Different things, different um, lightning rod political things. And he sided with his church over the truth. So he turned in his badge. It was over homosexuality in the church. And so he turned in his badge. And he actually turned it into me, which is amazing because he was kind of frustrating to deal with because I could never get him to do what I wanted him to do, even though he was told he was supposed to follow me. And that's another thing. You can't get delivered if you're not following God. Are you playing by the rules and you want to go through deliverance, you're going to get your teeth kicked in. So anyways, he turns in his badge on a Saturday and I go to a service that Sunday and I've got nothing and I'm just like, hey guys, what's going on? Well, long story short, I get the, the nexus, the, the moment of writing a book. And you know how that is. Probably half the people that are alive have wanted to write a book. I mean, let's just be real. And I kind of started dabbling with it and I started writing it. And this is like seven or eight years ago. And life would get in the way and this, that or another. And then about a year, a year and a half ago, I put, I don't have it on my phone, but I put a picture on my phone of a book with a tree growing out of it. As a reminder. <laughs> You're called to write a book. This is the destiny. It's not just about grinding out each day, making it to the weekend. <clears throat> I'm calling you. This is where I'm calling you. This is where you're supposed to go. You're supposed to do this. And I put it right in front of my face. And I started adapting my morning devotional. Instead of doing a Bible study, I was, I was writing. And then it's like I wrote half the book in about a sixth of the time. And it'll be, it'll be done. It's in design right now. So it's been submitted. It's gone through the line edit. It's in, it's in design, the cover, things like that. It's about unmasking the devil's ultimate role. Amen? So it'll be out by the end of this year. But my point is, it's having the goal in mind. And what do you have to do to get to that place? Remind yourself of it. One bite at a time, one step at a time. Anyone else on the concept of deliverance is a matter not just getting from, but getting to. Anybody else? One, one thing I, I felt years back, the Lord tried to show me, because I got a construction background, and he's the cornerstone. So how do I set my foundation to finish that, that footer for that cornerstone, which is Christ, and each brick I lay down the road, how am I going to add to that cornerstone, which that's mm -hmm. where my strength is, mm -hmm. and that's where... I'm going to finish this house, this temple, mm -hmm. you know, because, uh, yeah, I've definitely fallen short, but he showed me that. This is how you build my temple in mm -hmm. your heart, is you you got to stay on that cornerstone, but how are you laying that foundation, that mm -hmm. footer? Because that's what's going to support what you lay on it. Everything in going your up. your life and your mm -hmm. walk with me. 100%. And then, <laughs> it's good, you know, I'll stumble and I'll fall, and I didn't lay that course right. I'll find and I got to start back. Mm -hmm. So like, that's kind of how the Lord showed me. And then and that's even, even sharing somebody else who just came to the Lord. How are you going to start this relationship with them? You it makes it simple. Somewhere. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, just a simple analogy. That's a, that's a great analogy. It's simple, pr profound. He's that, he's, everything lines up with Christ. And if you get everything lined up with Christ, you're going to get out of here and you're going to get into there. My, uh, Second concept is this. Um, spiritual warfare is an umbrella term. <coughs> And it's a big umbrella. Deliverance is a part of that. They're not the same thing. 
Deliverance and spiritual warfare are not the same thing. And this is in my opinion. It's not like, okay. But when you think about it, if the deliverance is a part of spiritual warfare, no one would deny that. What else could we put in under the umbrella of spiritual warfare? Worship. What's that? Worship. Praise, worship. Kelly said tongues. I'm going to say the gifts. Anyone else? God's word. The word, truth. Anyone else? You know, a good thing, to, a good way to look at it is in the natural, in a in a battle, in a war. What do you have to do to be successful? You got to be trained. You got to, as Paul said, you got to discipline your body. You got to exercise. You got to be under control. You got to, you know, if you don't eat, you're going to be lousy. I'll tell you a personal story. When I first started speaking here again, I had my thing and I fasted that whole day and I would eat breakfast and I wouldn't, or maybe I'd eat lunch because I am in construction. So I'd eat lunch and I wouldn't eat dinner and I'd come in and I'd be like, eat a lot, you know, and ready to go. And God honored that and it worked about five times and then I laid an egg. And so I'm like, all right, I'm throwing it all out the window. I'm going to do the complete opposite. And I went to Golden Corral and I laid another egg. No, I'm just. <laughs> and I, I had my dinner and I was, I was like, hey, this is nice. I actually have some energy. You know, I'm actually, you know. And so even something simple as taking care of your body can be under here. Like Paul talked about, to be ready for spiritual warfare, training the information, being under authority. What about obedience? Being under uh, obedient, being under authority. You're like you're going to be a horrible soldier if you don't follow the brigade and your orders, right? You're going to be out there on your own. You get blown up, and that's what happens. We got a lot of rogue people that just want to come in like the wind and leave like the wind, right? We just saw it 20 minutes ago. That's hard to do, to march to the beat of your own drum, and then you're going to go out and you're going to tear down strongholds and all this sort of stuff. So yeah, being under authority, being obedient to God. Anyone else? Love in your energies. Love. So I'm going to put that under fruit. See, I. It's like almost that. I had something something in mind. So. <laughs> so the fruit of the spirit, right? Love, mercy, kindness, grace, and that's how you can minister to somebody. They don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And when we first get filled with the Holy Spirit and we uh, know about deliverance and we look around and we see all these people that are jacked up from the neck up and the waist down and we want to do whatever we can to help them. But if it's like Erica said, it becomes more about the task and less about the person. I think we're off. Follow the commitment. Yep. Obedience, following, following the Lord. But I want to park on that last statement that I said for a minute, because one of the things that changed when I was, you know, some, a little bit of time does some good. You kind of look at things differently, you appreciate it differently, I uh, change my approach to my speaking and things like that. And I feel like I'm better for it, for not, Brother Mike didn't ask me for a whole year. I almost want to cry. I'm not kidding. He didn't ask me for a whole year and he never told me why. And that's some of the brilliance of Brother Mike, because a lot of people, like myself included, I want to tell you why. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I can't wait. Oh, I'm glad you asked. Let me go to my list. I'm kidding. But that's a sign of needing deliverance, right? You want to tell everybody everything and straighten them out from one side up, as opposed to trusting God. So now I'm not getting my answer from Brother Mike. I'm getting it from the Lord. See, all those people that are offended at Brother Mike because he didn't respond to the email. And guess what? He's smarter than them. I will look up to the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. So... One of the things that changed in me when I, when I came back is I was more empathetic to people. 
And I think that comes with age, especially for guys. That's that fruit. That's that, hey, nice to see you. Thanks for coming. I try to make it a point on a Friday night. It's just everybody, even they're just sitting there, I want to, hey, you know, bless you. I want to go over, I want to touch every shoulder. I want to say, thank you for coming. And that's that fruit. We can, we can, we can win with a food fight. <laughs> so deliverance is a part of spiritual warfare, but not all, it's, there's more to spiritual warfare. Now, to take the, the war analogy, it, you're fighting in a battle, you get captured, you're a POW, you're bound, you're controlled, you're imprisoned by the enemy, now you need deliverance. Does that make sense? Now we're on a rescue mission. You're bound. You're controlled. The enemy has control over you. Does that make sense? Yes. Now we need deliverance. But I can do these other things and I, I'm, I'm battling the shield of faith with which I can quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, right? The helmet of salvation, keeping in mind who I am in Christ and what he's done for me. The breastplate of righteousness, like where I stand in Christ. These things are part of spiritual warfare, operating the gifts, a, a word, a prophetic word for somebody, the discerning of spirits, praying in tongues for somebody. These are part of spiritual warfare, but they're not necessarily what I need to get out of, get out of jail, but they can keep me from going to jail. So again, a lot of times people want to focus solely on deliverance, but there has to be a holistic approach. I believe it comes down to discipleship and deliverance. Amen. And I don't think you can be a great disciple unless you've gone through deliverance. And I don't think you're going to keep your deliverance if you're not a strong disciple. Part of my success is... Man, I got in church, I got in TV church, I got into books, I got everything. I, I was taking notes, watching TV preachers, and I'm ashamed of it because I didn't have any money, so I wasn't a, it wasn't a threat to me. Some of you get that later. I, I dove in. The deliverance was actually kind of on the side. For me to stay free from the snares and traps and, and schemes of the enemy, I got to be walking, talking like Jesus. Again, that's, that's the goal. Like, what's your relationship like with Jesus? How much time are you spending with him? Are you in his word and things like that? And I don't want to come across as coming down, but I'm just saying, like, that's a huge part. Like, I can't walk out my freedom and deliverance acting like a knucklehead. <laughs> you know, in an army, if you're walking and talking like the enemy, you're going to get shot. They're going to turn you over. They're going to get, right, get out of here. You're no help. If you're not with us, if, if, if you're not for us, you're against us, get out of here. The example that comes to mind here is Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. He was engaged in a spiritual warfare, but he... There's no way in God's green earth that he needed deliverance. <laughs> There's no, he said the enemy got nothing on this. Amen. You guys remember that story? Right? In the wilderness, after 40 days of fasting, and the devil came to tempt him, and, you know, twisting God's word, and trying to get him to exalt himself. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life, those same three things that you see there. Jesus said, no, no, this is a battle. I see it for what it is. I'm going to fight you with the truth and the, and the truth and the word and, and some of the gifts. And, uh -uh. He kept, him, kept himself clean. That's spiritual warfare. Any thoughts, any comments on that? Questions? Does that help anybody? Oh, yeah. To me, it's helpful. I'm, that's why I'm obviously talking about it. But does that, is that a helpful concept? 
And what happens is, is people, they go through deliverance and does anyone have any favorite bondages they like people to get freed from? <laughs> Lust always comes to mind. I guess it's because I'm a guy. That's things that guys, all guys have dealt with or deal with. Don't yeah. give me any weird looks, okay? Because God's done a work in me. I'm a pure man of God. Amen? But anyways, let's say... Uh, Rejection, lust, fill in the blank. Let's say that is a big thing that you dealt with and you got delivered from it, okay? And you're walking down the road, do, 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 six months later, you know, feeling pretty good about yourself. Oh, yeah, man, I don't think that way anymore. I control my eyes. I feel pretty good about myself. And then that storm cloud shows up. The enemy comes for an opportune time and he throws some rejection or some lust or something like that at you. And if people don't know the difference between deliverance and spiritual warfare, what happens, and I see it happen here, is they get freaked out and they think that they still got stuff that's packed down in deep. Wait a minute, I've been doing all this work and all this thing, I made all this progress, and I still got more to do. Well, wait, wait, hold on. That may be the case. You know, I, I, I went through a whole nother round of deliverance when I got married because I had no, those, all those scenarios and situations and in-laws that none of that stuff have been triggered so now i'm in a new situation a new environment and i'm getting different triggers and oh oh i, I gotta deal with that now i dealt with all my stuff right but now i got it's it's a different scenario i'm in a different situation maybe you've always been the boss and now you're an employee maybe maybe you're not working anymore now you're retired you know maybe you got too much time on your hands something changes scenario changes and maybe there was something that was kind of lurking laying low that you got to deal with right or maybe it is strategic maybe there was a, like a delay and like a, the enemy's waiting and he's trying to he's trying to wait you out and you know pounce at an opportune time you know that stuff happens but what also happens is that second round of attack is not from within, it's from without. I hope I'm not diverging if I am, let me know. What if somebody marries a person who's a Christian and they haven't gone through deliverance of sin? This kind of seems like you start all over again. It's going to be a lot of work. New battleground. It'll be a lot of work, but you know, God, God is more than able, right? And those, all those scenarios and situations, it's like we can look at it as like, oh man, shouldn't have done it that way. Oh, stepped in it again. Or it's like, okay, I'm going to go back through another, going to learn more from Christ. I'm going to be able to be more equipped, more experienced, because he always has that. He, see, the thing is, he knows the end from the beginning. He has that in mind. I love it. And Peter, he says, he says, I pray for you that your faith won't fail you. But he says, he says, you're going to be tempted. Satan has demanded to sift you like wheat. Luke 22, he's demanded, Peter. But don't worry, I pray for you that your faith won't fail you. And when you return to me, strengthen the brethren. Okay, yeah, you wanted to get married. And you're about to get married and then some. And you're going to be kicking yourself, son. I told you to wait. And you didn't want to wait. But since we're going there, you're going to learn a lot. And I want you to help a lot. I like what uh, Pastor Mike Maiden said. He says, marriage isn't to make you happy, it's to make you holy. It's going to bring things to the surface that you're going to have to work through and deal with, whether they're saved. My wife started speaking until she's eight years old. I mean, it's still, we were not immune. I was in deliverance ministry. We're not immune from just that. I mean, I was always told the two shall become one flesh, and I thought it was just going to happen, and it was friction and... You know, different stuff. And then the in-laws. You always got to mention the in-laws because everybody laughs. Unless you're an in-law. So deliverance, spiritual warfare. It can happen in the enemy. He says, oh, you didn't really get set free from that. He tried to psych you out. I was a kid, he'd say, psych! And then he'd say, not! Oh, you thought you are delivered? Not! Well, that, that might be an external attack. Don't just assume that your flesh is being fill in the blank that it's internal. Because your flesh is in between the internal and the external. 
So you might get that feeling from something happening within, you might get that feeling from something happening without. Is this helping? Yes. And you deal with it differently. Like I use lust as an example because that's something God's delivered me from, from, from that spiritual stronghold. And every once in a while, I'll start noticing some of those feelings coming back. And so I fight my fanny off. No, stop it. Bye, in the name of Jesus. Stop. So either I went six months without those thoughts and feelings and had no problem and was not triggered in any way, or this is an external attack. I'm not always saying it's one way or the other, but I'm saying that that is a legitimate scenario where it is an external attack. And that's where you need spiritual warfare. You don't need deliverance. Stand firm in your faith. And when you've done all to stand, keep standing. Resist. Those are all things that are happening from outside. One of the things I've noticed too is a lot of people think that they're doing something wrong when they're getting these. That's my whole point. That's, the thing. They, that's what I'm trying to. I'm I trying to. These old, I still got these old. I said, "Hey, Jesus was tempted in all ways." You know, that this could be an external attack, and, and a lot of people they start thinking, "Hey, man, I'm doing something wrong on this and that." And I'm like, "No, you're getting tempted. That's good. Now just resist the devil. You no, know, just and, and, and that's it." So that's a, that's exactly why I want to point this out. We had another, something else. Yeah, I was thinking about that scripture, right? It talks about um, no temptations come behind you that's not common to man, and the Lord always makes a way out. Mm -hmm. So regardless if it's still in you or it's external, you can mm -hmm. overcome it, mm -hmm. yes. right? And that was important for me to learn when I was going through my own deliverance, because like you, lust and perversion and all of that, and I'd be tempted, but I knew I could just overcome it by mm -hmm. resisting. Mm -hmm. And that's having an eye on the end. And that's part of it. And it's like, if you get caught in your own little world, woe is me, the sky is falling, you're going to have a really hard time fighting and maintaining your ground. But if you see the big picture, that even if, like Peter, even if I step in it and deny my Lord three times, when he, to my face, told me it was going to happen and he warned me, I mean, that was a pretty big misstep, right? Like, Jesus told him, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny. I mean, he knew. I mean, obviously, he was not going to be able to overcome that temptation. Christ knew his weakness, but he stepped in it bad. Like, that was his own stuff. That was his own mess. And God's like, I'm cool with that. I can work with that. But I can't have you work with that, Peter, if you fall into self-pity and shame and wallow and get fixated on yourself. Woe is me. I'm such a failure. You, I can't use you in that place. I can't use you in that lowly place. I want to lift you up out of that lowly place. I want to polish you, shine you, send you to the dent doctor and get you fixed up looking nice, looking like a pretty machine. And I'm going to say, hey, hey, look at what my Lord has done to me. Because I was lost and now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. If someone else was, raise their hand. I was going to say, yeah, he, he fell, but that was before he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And once he was filled with the Holy Spirit, he didn't fall. That's the advantage that we keep. True. True. But he was also walking with Jesus. That's the disadvantage we don't have. You have to walk with him, but yeah. So he, he was right there. But my point, is, my point is this, that even when you mess up, you lose the battle. You get infected or affected spiritually. Look, look beyond the horizon. Look beyond the horizon. What is God? What are you using this for, God? He's using it for something. Even if you didn't do what you were supposed to do, God is greater, stronger, more dynamic, smarter, defter, more powerful, more creative than any and all of our mistakes. And you... you, you you have to help people get out of that defeated mindset. Even if you did lose, God can reuse that thing. He's a redeemer. I mean, he, that's, 
his power, that's his majesty. He restores, he redeems, he brings back value to things that have been deemed valueless by the world. He redeems them. He places new value on them. He restores. And if he could do that when you were lost in the world and, and blaspheming God and, and, and thumbing your nose at God and running the opposite way, and if he can do that and, and transform your life, he can do that with a well-intentioned person that made a mistake. And you can tell someone, it's okay. Because the enemy wants to bluff at you. Half the times it's a bluff with this guy. It's a bluff. He's bluffing. Ah, that's it. That's no. Stop. Mm -mm. It's a bluff. God, God can use it in Jesus' name. Amen. Anyone else? I was just gonna say it's pretty neat how God will put different things in people's failures and shortcomings where they fell short, like the example of Peter. He fell short. He loved the Lord. He said, no, Lord, I wouldn't. But it shows the frailty and the flesh that's in us. But then, like you said, you meant God restores us. He redeems us. So it shows mm -hmm. we have the same hope and the same promises and forgiveness that Peter received. That's it. And that's why I love that verse. I think it's Romans 15. Through the endurance and encouragement of the scriptures, we have hope. So, like, we, we um, when we are familiar with the Bible and what has happened and what God has done in the lives of others uh, and in our peers, I mean, testimonies are really powerful. Um, that can be what strengthens us for the spiritual warfare, just like praise and worship. Let me see if I can find that real quick. It's such a neat verse. So Romans 15, 1, it says, We who are strong, oh, this is good, have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak. Mm -hmm. I, could, I could preach on that right now. Okay, Kelly, this is when we stop the tape and we tell everybody, okay, go out, get a bathroom, and come back in. <laughs> We're starting over. Oh, it wasn't recording. Let's start over. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak. That's going to get you set free right there. You know, because we have a tendency when we're strong to want to challenge and, and make, hey, you, you got to be strong. No, I, that's not what Jesus did. Jesus, oh yeah, look at me. I walk and talk with the Lord. I don't sin. What's wrong with you guys? <laughs> he didn't take that approach. But we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not just to please ourselves, not to look out for our own self-interest. This is coming out in Romans 14 where he's talking about eating food sacrificed to idols. And he says... He says, I'm convinced nothing is unclean of myself, but if me doing this is making a brother or sister sin and fall, then I'm not going to do it. Because why would you do something that you know it would make somebody fall if, they're, if Jesus had given their life for them? And you're going to make them stumble? He said, no, 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 no. You're getting focused on yourself. You have that right. But the greater command is to love, in essence. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endur endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. And this ties back into what I was saying earlier, that if we don't tell people where to go and the target, they may lack endurance. You know, it's the, the prize that motivates us. How many would go to work if you didn't get paid in two weeks on Friday? <laughs> Very few, okay. How, how many people, like you look at these professional sports, these athletes, they literally sacrifice their bodies. Like they're, they're going to be hurting for lots of years, but they do it for the prize. They want to be a world champ. They want to be a champion. So that is, that's the power that it helps us to endure. So the last part here, I've got 12, don't get worried. I've got 12 best practices for deliverance, okay? So I'm calling this Deliverance 101. I've got the two concepts, 
And I got 12 best practices. Number one, repentance. True, living repentance. Life-giving, life-breathing repentance. Not dead repentance. Not half-hearted repentance. True, living repentance. I cannot get someone from point A to point B if they don't are not sorry for whatever part they played in point A. I cannot deliver them. You're not in the right box. You don't have the shipping label. You're not leaving the warehouse. You're not even in transit. You cannot even get onto the delivery truck. Does that make sense? You don't even qualify. You're incomplete. You can't, how, you can't go outside dressed like that. You're naked. Not going out like that. Are you crazy? You got to stay inside. You haven't repented. You're still filthy dirty. Take a shower. Does that make sense? Like, repentance. It's like, what did I do? I like what Brother Mike says. What? Apologize for your 5%. Somebody might have done something horrendous, heinous to you, but were you critical of them after the fact? Were you wanting to throw stones? Were you wishing them ill will? Were you letting it go and forgiving like God commands? So those are all oppor beautiful opportunities to repent. Amen? Repentance. And somebody is coming in for deliverance and they're not repenting, you can't, you can't help them. They're stuck. They're still focused on themselves. And maybe it's like, hey, you're not going to get to the finish line if you stay here. You have every right to stay there. People won't blame you for staying there. But if you stay there, you're stuck and you're not going to get across the finish line. Number two, rebuke. What is a rebuke? The number one example that comes to mind for me is when Jesus tells Peter, stand behind thee, Satan. Rebuke. A strong command. No. My favorite deliverance words? No. Stop. Out. Well, you know, I went. To, I go to church every week, and uh, I pay my tithes, and uh, I believe in the promises of God. And so, uh, devil, you have to leave. It doesn't work. You can't reason with the devil. You're not gonna like state your claims, and this is why you got to go. And I'm sick and tired of you. And uh. -uh. No! Stop! Now you heard that external. You know what I just heard in my heart? In Jesus' name. Now that's a double-edged sword. What do I mean by that? You have to know that any power at all that you have or anyone has over the devil is because of Jesus Christ. Amen. I like what Peter said uh, not too long ago. He said, he's, Jesus is the first one that showed up and started casting out demons. That's pretty noteworthy. Good job, Peter. You ain't going to be able to do it without him. I'm not looking at Elijah and Moses and David in here. You're right. We're in here. Okay. We got five or six of the most exceptional people that have ever lived over five, six, seven thousand years. Okay, we're, let's just go ahead and just say we're not at that level. So we're not going to go bouncing out demons without Jesus. Now with Jesus, we're at that level and then some. Amen. We can do a lot more, but it's with Christ. So now it's a double-edged sword. Why do I say that? Because some people... They're saying, they're using the name because it's almost like they feel like that's the recipe. That's, the, that's what I got to do. In Jesus' name, 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 in Jesus' name. Like, no, like, you know you're under authority. 
You know your power. You know it. You're not trying to psych yourself up or psych out the devil. That's the difference. Does that make sense? You can hear it in people's voices sometimes. They're, they're trying to psych themselves up or they're trying to convince the devil. Like, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. <laughs> Sounds like a cat's being strangled. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, hey, God is awesome and God could honor that and move on that. Like, I'm, he's much more merciful and gracious than any of us. I mean, you never know when he's just going to move. He's the deliverer, right? He's the deliverer. He's the one. Point him to Jesus. He's the one. He's the deliverer. And he can do it if he wants. He can do it over that type of prayer. But, I mean, if, if you truly know, you know that you know, that's powerful when you know that you have that authority. Th that's powerful. And so I know it's in Jesus' name, and I'm standing on that, and I'm telling him, Ow! Number three, with and under authority. Acts 19, 15 says, Paul we know, and Jesus we know, but who in the world are you? The seven sons of Sceva, the Jewish exorcist. What's it in? Um, I think I have it down here. Where is the centurion and his servant? In Matthew chapter 8. So he says, the centurion says, I am, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed, for I too am a man under authority. And I tell the soldiers, go, and he goes. Another one comes, and he comes. Do this, and he does it. Look at that understanding of authority versus the seven sons of Sceva, and the demon saying, who, who are you? Like, you don't, I don't see your credentials. Right? I don't, mm, I, I think they can tell when we're under authority and when we're not. Yes, sir. Wouldn't that be uh, like the, when the Holy Spirit came over, and the, Spirit, the Holy Spirit was given to the disciples that said, go out and heal the sick and cast out demons. The sons of Sceva didn't have that authority, which was the Holy Spirit or the right. power of God. Well, we don't know. It doesn't say exactly what yeah. they're saying, what they're seeing, but and you know, and you could chalk it up to yeah, yeah, because obviously they were not saved. It specifically says the seven sons of Sceva. It says they were Jewish exorcists. It doesn't say they were falling the way, um, but it, it, you know, I think that it's worthwhile pointing out, you know, that. It's when we're operating in line with Christ and under Christ that then the devil knows, oh, this dude has the authority, right? He's not his first day on his job pushing around a broom, and he just made it in the building yesterday. Like, this guy is, he's the real deal. And uh, I, that goes back to obedience, and that goes back to discipleship of being under, under Christ's authority. Amen. Amen. Number four, Jesus cast them out with a word. With a word. Again, you don't need a whole dissertation. You don't need a whole explanation. You don't need, you're not going to convince the devil that they're wrong and they've got to leave. Thanks for coming, guys. Yeah, you're free to go if you have anything to do, if, I, if I'm boring to you. That's all, it's all good. I don't want to hold anybody against their will. No, I know. I know. I know. I'm just being silly. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. God bless you guys. <clears throat> Jesus casts them out with a word. And sometimes in our dialogue with deliverance, we get too caught up in conversation with the devil. Like, I, he's a liar. He's not a straight shooter. He's rebellious. He's not going to submit to you just because, you know, you convince him. They call it a devil's advocate for a reason. You're going to say this, and next thing you've ever been in a conversation, and you're trying to, trying to debate with somebody and work through something, and you say this, and then they say that, and you're like, wait a minute, what? I'm responding to this. It had nothing to do with my original statement. 
That's the devil's advocate. It's just a circular thing. They're going to go around and around and around. You're not going to win an argument with the devil. Jesus cast them out with the word. That's why I like those short, concise, strong, authoritative, like if a thief was in my house. Get out of here now! Go! It's, there's... Now, screaming in of itself, let's talk about that, is not what works. Not by power, might, but by His Spirit, says the Lord, right? But screaming is important that they know you're for real. And that you're actually exercising your will. Like, someone who screams is, is ready. <laughs> they're sick and tired of being sick and tired. Like, they're, they're ready. But the screaming in and of itself is not what's going to drive out the devil. But you're showing them, I've had enough. Yes. Wouldn't it be that, that godly anger? Sure. That godly anger towards sure. the enemy, towards sin, and what's in this person, that's what's coming out. Jesus flipping the tables in the, in the outer courts. Godly anger. Ah, get out of here. What are you doing in here? This is supposed to be a house of prayer. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Would it be a... Uh... Are you sure I'm all buttoned up here? Um, wouldn't it be more like revelation? If there's a difference between someone who has who has had a revelation compared to someone who has not had a revelation? As far as getting delivered? Um, casting out. As far as like what what that stronghold is? Yes. 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 Of course. Yeah. Like you can identify, so, so you're kind of, I think what you're asking is, instead of just being general, like no, out, like if I say lust in the name of Jesus. Yes. Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, I, the assumption is that I know what I'm battling when I'm saying that. And so when, I'm, when you're doing deliverance, you're trying to help someone, and I'll, I'll say, okay, and I can tell they're not really fighting, they're not really upset, they're just kind of, and it's hard. I remember being in the situation, coming up to the altar, wanting to get prayer, want, hoping to get rid of schizophrenia, and just feeling kind of, kind of lost and aimless a little bit. And so I can, I can, I can relate to that. So when I see someone who's not really fighting, as far as what you can tell on the outside, which is, you know, it's only half the story, right? But as far as I can tell, they're not really fighting. And say, okay, on the count of three, you're gonna yell out. So I got one, two, three, out. And I want to coach them through so that they're fighting. Because the thing is, we have some mighty men and women of God here that'll blow your socks off and the devil's right with them. But if they can't walk it out, they're a sitting duck. So part of the, part of the role as a deliverance minister is to prepare them, just like in the military. Like, oh yeah, you can be part of the military, but we're not gonna give you a helmet, we're not gonna give you a gun. Yeah, why don't you bring your own shoes? Those are some nice looking Nikes. All right, come on in, you're good. No, you don't do that. You gotta equip them, you gotta train them. They, they have to be able to fight. I tell people, I can't go with you, no one can go with you all the time, everywhere, wherever you go. We can't, it's impossible. At the end of the day, you're gonna be by yourself at least half of the time, and you need to be able to fight on your own. So if while you've got them here, and you see that they're not really showing that metal, okay, I, I need you to get angry at the devil. All that, and I'll tell them sometimes, I say, all the years, the crying, the pain, the frustration, the heartache that the devil has caused you, you're going to take it out on him right now, okay, on the count of three. And, 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 and then I'm yelling with him. Rah, 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 rah. And the world thinks you're going crazy, but they're the ones going crazy. <laughs> and I want to coach them. I want to get to that place where they can fight. So even the archangel Michael did not bring up a railing accusation, but simply said, the Lord rebuke you. I love that. The archangel Michael, he's like, bro, oh, dude, you look horrible. Devil, why did you do that? You couldn't listen to God one more day. You dummy. Ah, why did you? You know, it's just its kind of funny to think of what the Archangel Michael could have said to the devil, right? You know, he's known him for probably a while, and he's like, okay, you're, 
What are you doing? No. The Lord rebuke you. That's it. I rebuke you. Stop it. It's nonsense. Stop it. All right, number five. Not mocking, belittling, reasoning, explaining with the devil. We kind of talked on that a little bit. And I told a story not, that happened not too long ago, and that's what the guy was doing. He was mocking the spirits when he was trying to cast them out, and he was not being effective. He was mocking them. Oh, you think you're going to... Oh, you... Okay, was it? <laughs> Watch out for the lightning bolt. Yeah. Who are we to mock the devil? I mean, are you trying to get your face kicked in? If the Archangel Michael didn't do it, and Jesus didn't do it, but just plainly told him what to do and where to do, and you better get on it quick, bud. Get out of here. I, I got to stop saying that. People keep leaving. Um, <laughs> number six, standing on the Scripture. Knowing and acting on the truth. You gotta, I'm telling you guys, so many times the devil is bluffing. Oh, you committed, you blasting the Holy Spirit. But I, I so deeply want to be right with God. But I think I blasting the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you wouldn't care. Standing on the scripture, standing on the truth, acting on the truth. Not just standing, but that's why I say standing. Standing on the scripture, knowing it, acting on it. Going back to Luke twenty two thirty two, 32, when Jesus says, you're going to get tossed around like a rag doll, Peter. But don't worry, I've prayed for you that your faith won't fail you. So when you get knocked down, the most important thing that you have to have in spiritual battle is faith. That is, that is my, here, me, faith. Because when you make a mess of it, and you deserve what you're getting from the devil, you got to have faith that God can still use you and will use you and will restore you and cleanse you and restore you and strengthen and confirm and establish and send you out and redeem you and restore you. you got to have faith. you got to have faith when you're down and you're out. you got to have faith. Jesus himself said, don't worry, Peter. I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail you. Most important thing in spiritual battle, faith. And guys, by the way, this is a good time to touch on something else I want to do. When we're delivering people, we can call out and speak to their destiny and we can build them up with our words. Amen. Be blessed. So what, you, just, you just rip everything out. Well, why not put something in there while you're at it? Amen. And that's another thing that I've started doing more recently is, I, yeah, lovelessness, get out. Rejection, get out in Jesus' name. And I pray the Father will pour out His love on you and, sh and just envelop you with His loving kindness. I speak faith, mountain-moving faith in Jesus' name. The fruit of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit. Lord, stir up those gifts right now in Jesus' name. Stir them up. Signs, miracles, wonders. I pray for discernment right now in Jesus' name. Why? Because I don't want them to be empty. They have to be able to fight. It's not enough just to get delivered. Amen. So what? You were a POW and you got out, but imagine what a POW would look out after escaping a hostile nation prison camp. They'd be lucky if they had any clothes on their back. They would have no weapons, maybe one, no vehicle, no money. Like, come on, let it sink in. When someone gets delivered, it's like they're getting snatched out of a POW camp. Amen. They've been bound for so long, they don't know which way is up. They're confused. They, they have no resources. They're, they're in a foreign land. When someone first goes through deliverance, they're in a foreign land. They, they, everything is different. Their family dynamic has changed. Their work has changed. Their view of themselves has changed. It's all changed. 
They're literally that guy. I, I heard a story one time he broke out of a, I think it was World War I prison camp in, Sib in Siberia. And he had to walk an ungodly amount of miles, hundreds of miles. Which in Siberia, 10 miles would be enough. He had to walk, it was, I don't remember how many, but it's, hundreds, it's a documented case, hundreds of miles that he had to walk. And he had two bullets in his pocket, and he would just walk 100 steps, and he would take the one and he would put it back in the other, and he'd walk another 100 steps, or he'd put it from one and put it back in the other, something like that, that he just kept himself going. But when people get delivered, they're, 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 they're like newborn babies. They're naked. They're helpless. They don't have any power. They don't have any strength. I mean, they might be a mighty woman or God coming in, but a lot of times they're jacked up. They don't know how to walk and talk like a Christian. They, they, they've been under that dark cloud their entire lives. Their personalities, their thinking, their mindsets, their beliefs about themselves, God, and others, it's all twisted. And if you take, oh, good job. You got all the weeds out. Well, let's plant some flowers in Jesus' name. Let's sow some seeds. Let's speak to their future. Let's speak to who they are. I know we always say, oh yeah, when the strong, he comes back and he founds a house swept in an order and clean and empty. Well, it's, uh, that, it's, kind of, you would, it's not an irreasonable conclusion to say that that person was saved because they got delivered. So, I mean, we always say, yeah, you know, okay, they didn't have Jesus, ah, you know, this, that, another. What, what if they were just empty and aimless? What if they just didn't have any identity in Christ? What if they just had not stirred up their gifts like Paul had told Pitt Timothy to do? What if they were just like that POW who had been beaten and, 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 and stripped and, and, and stoned and all these things and he was so disfigured and weak and, and he, now he's coming out and now he's trying to battle and fight? you got to speak into them. you got to speak into them truth and love and life and purpose. I speak that into them in Jesus' name. All right, I'll stop. Keep going. Yes. Preaching is my favorite thing. <laughs> Let's get it. Let's get it going. Come on. By the way, have Bible. We'll travel. Um, common sense. Number eight. Common sense. You don't need to be a super saint. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. We got note takers. <laughs> Repentance, rebuke, authority, with a word, not mocking, standing on scripture, seven is faith. Eight is common sense. Eight, common sense. You don't need to be a super saint. <laughs> I'll tell you a story. Years ago, I w at the old place, I was doing deliverance at the front, working on the altar, and this guy came up, and he is, uh, um, I've, I kind of remember it, which is amazing. He comes up, and I'm praying for him, and I'm, and I'm praying this, that, another, you know, lost, this, different things. I'm noticing he's kind of like, Cares a lot how he looks. So, he's... And I'm like, okay, I see where the devil's going on this one. So I start coming against the spirit of homosexuality. <laughs> and uh, it was like a year later, uh, my sister-in-law knew this guy. And she's like, Oh, yeah, so-and-so, Jake from State Farm, you know, he <laughs> he ran into him the other day. Thank you, Lord. And uh, he'd actually been there, and some dude was trying to cast out homosexuality. He said he never struggled with that, and this, that, or another. And I was like, jeez. Oh, <laughs> you don't have to be a super saint. You know, we want to we want to be moved and led by the Spirit and and sensing these things and, and, and you know and it, it is exciting and you do sometimes you sense what people got going on and 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 we do we can look at the out external man as a reflection of the inner man right I mean usually if you got a big old smile on your face you you got a smile inside or you're gonna about knock that guy upside the head right <laughs> like, oh boy you got it coming but we can't rely solely on that and instead of being super spiritual and you know who knows what the enemy was trying to do or whatever I don't I don't know I don't know but I I could have done a better job I could have been more tactful I didn't need to be that specific and I think 
it's probably as a general standard is to speak in general terms. And you know, if you're in a counseling session and someone confides in you and you want to get down to business, yeah. But I, and, and, and so I started asking more questions. Hey, what's going on? What do you need prayer for? You know, I will rely on the Holy Spirit and some intuition and just kind of what I'm sensing. But uh, also, I, hey, what's going on? What can I pray for you about? Amen. We don't have to be like always in the spirit because we're going to miss some stuff. And we might offend somebody. Sorry, Jake from State Farm. <laughs> Number nine is start the uh, rebuilding process, which is what I was talking about earlier, and he was talking about building. And, it, and we, all the times in Scripture, it tells us who we are, our inheritance and this, and who we are in Christ, and seated in heavenly places. And 1 Peter 2.9 says, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So there's that, there's that deliverance, there's that progression again, out of darkness into light. But he's, he's reminding them, you're chosen, you're royal. You know, a lot of people come in here and they feel they're in the dumps. They're at the end, you know, wife's left and, and they, all these issues and this and, you know, or whatever. And they're, they're the bottom of the rope and they're barely hanging on. And... For someone to say with authority and conviction, you're chosen, you're royal in Christ, you're holy in His eyes, you're forgiven, you're washed in the blood. Those things can be powerful. It can be powerful. I remember one time I was leaving a men's uh, meeting and I was still struggling with mental illness. And I don't even think the guy knew, but he was like, he said it's like so convincingly, I'll never forget, he says that you have power, love, and a sound mind. He just spoke those words. It's like, it's like, you know, it kind of just straightened up and, oh yeah, hmm. It just, it resonated. Yeah, that is, that is, that is who I am. Amen. Start the rebuilding process, number nine. Number ten, the gifts and the fruit. I mentioned that earlier, you know. It's great to have the gifts, but without the fruit, you're kind of that person nobody likes. Mighty man of God, but I don't. I, where's the kindness? Where's the goodness? Where's the where's the gentleness? Where's those things go a long way? Now, there's some people you need to rustle, ruffle their feathers. Kelly has a list in the back if you want to see that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but for most of humanity, and I think it's, I love the analogy fruit. It's like, it's sweet, it's refreshing, it's colorful. Usually fruit's colorful. Unless you make it late to Walmart. All right. <laughs> the gifts and the fruit. The gifts and the fruit. And you can call that out in people. You can call out you can call out the fruit. You're speaking that, building them up, edifying them. Eleven. Pray. Oh yeah, what's up? Hey, real quick, just with that fruit and the gifts thing, one of the most uh, formative teachings that I got from Brother Mike way back when I was when he didn't compute to me at first, but he said the fruit doesn't have anything to do with your gifts. The gifts of cause are without repentance. So a lot of people, when they look on the outwards, they're like, well, how, are, how is God working miracles through that guy? He's this, he's that, sure. he's this. Well, he's still got the spiritual gifts. He's got, he's, he was given those. He just never worked on his character, you know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. and, and that piece of it was like, okay, wow, we really do have to be fruit inspectors. Uh, big time, you know, and that was an eye-opening thing because obviously it comes out of a different part of you, you know, the spirit man. And that's important to, to teach the people, right? You, you, you could prophesy and you can, you know, have a revelation for somebody. And then when, once that's done and you're operating in the spirit, you kill that person with your own words. Yeah. And that's happened to me. So yeah. it's, mm -hmm. it's right on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, without love, it's, yeah. it's meaningless. Yeah. It's, 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 it's meaningless. 100%. Anyone else? 
11, this is a novel idea. Pray. Pray. If you've been ministering someone and you think about them the next day, the next week, pray for them. You know, it seems simple, but I think, you know, I, I start with me. I know I don't do it all the time. And, you know, I'm trying to get better at that, trying to, trying to be more intentional about prayer. And what I've been doing over the last few weeks or so is just if I do think of someone throughout the course of my day, and then I'll put a prayer with it, you know. And uh, um, so, uh, so, yeah, if you think of that person that you come across here and what better person to pray for them than you, if, especially if you know what they're going through, what they're struggling with. Uh, the last one, number 12, start with God, end with God. Start with God, end with God. I had a young man that I was mentoring a few years ago, and he could barely even hold a conversation. His mind was like so frozen spiritually that it was really hard for him to even get out of his head to have a conversation with you. And so we, we, we went around and around on things many, many times. We went around and around many, many times. And um, the kind of one mantra that I caught myself saying again and again and again is start with God, end with God. And I think that as much as I feel like everything I shared is valuable today, I think this might be the most valuable, that when you're pursuing your own deliverance or you're pursuing deliverance with someone else, if you keep this in mind to start with God, end with God, it'll go well. And what I mean by that is if I'm having an issue and I'm struggling, I need to start with God, I need to go to God first. And I need to ask God, why did I respond that way? Why did I lose my patience? Why am I frustrated? Why do I respond that way? And then I say, give, from experience, give yourself, give God and yourself time to get that answer. You might get it right away. It might be later that day. It might be a week or a month, and then the light bulb goes off, and you're like, oh, yeah, that's why I responded that way. I felt disrespected. Or this has been the run-up to it. So when I say start with God, you're, instead of like, what am I, this, and me, and the devil, and that, and Susie, and Billy, or what, you know, like, uh, just catch your breath, start with God. Lord, show me. If there be any... Anything in me, start with me. Create in me a clean heart. Renew in me a right spirit. Like start, like, okay, God. And then when you work through it, end with God. Like we were talking about earlier, the point is that next progression, that next step. So I realize I've got a, a character issue, a fruit issue. I'm not being very patient. Why am I not very patient? Oh, my dad, you know, blah, 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 blah. Okay, now I'm going to, what I call, redress the wound. I call it redressing the wound. So if you have a pretty serious cut and you got to open it up, you got to clean it out. You might have to put antiseptic in there. You might get, if you had a serious surgery, you probably got scar tissue. The doctor might need to go in and clean some stuff out. So you're redressing the wound. This might be something that happened when you were 15 years old. And it's still affecting you. I need to redress this wound. I need to, I need to open it up before God, even though it might hurt. I need to, okay, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm laying down just on the altar, just like Isaac. Okay, I'm ready for some heart surgery. Okay, open it up. And I'm going to redress this wound. I'm going to let them deal with it. And how do we redress it? We redress it with the spiritual things that we know, the principles and teachings and the ways of Christ. I forgive. <laughs> I speak blessing, not cursing. I pray. Things like that. I deal with that. I repent. I, a, a lot of times, and we got to fight to get that ugh out. 
That's probably the hardest thing, really, is to, to get that, that person that really wronged you or hurt you or took advantage of you or disappointed you, and it's almost like it's in your DNA. And it's almost like you're a tiger trying to change its stripes. Like, like, like ugh, I got to get off of this. I got to get, ugh. you have to like resist and push and push and push to get that thing out. But you're redressing the wound, you're cleaning it, and then applying whatever is needed, the word and this and time with the Lord and the presence of the Lord and the power of the Holy Spirit. And then you end with God. Give God praise. Amen. Give God credit. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for restoring me. Thank you for healing me. And that, that's just a beautiful way to bookend it as you start with God and end with God. Amen. 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 Any thoughts, questions? Was that helpful? Was this helpful? Thanks, guys. I appreciate that. Well, let's pray out. And then if anyone wants prayer, please come up to the front. And uh, we'll, hey, this is what we do around here. We'll be more than happy to pray for you. Thank you for allowing me to share with you today. And thank you for um, just really being God seekers. You know, I'm always, I, I, I pray to never take it for granted that how how much you're seeking God and uh, coming here weekday nights and this and that and the, the longer teachings. And, and uh, I know you just got a heart for God and that's a beautiful thing. And God will, God will re reward that. He's a debtor to no man. So you're putting in and you're sowing into the Lord and to the things of the kingdom of God. You're going to reap from that. You know, and the Bible says if we faint not, right? If we don't, if we don't stop, if we keep going for that destination, we know that we will reap. So I just, every time, I'm just encouraged by you guys, by your desire to be free, your desire to serve God, your, your uh, you know, patience and long-suffering to, to longer services. And, but I'm telling you, when God really moves, you know, that's the kind of things that happen. There's, there's almost like you can't get enough. And it's not me or it's not any one person here, but it's God. It's the Lord. And we're praying and we're believing that some, some amazing things are going to happen. And uh, maybe, maybe we'll never leave. You know, now we're up to four or five days a week with services and Sunday mornings and Sunday afternoons. And, you know, it'd be a beautiful thing if this place was open um, all the times that, that, that hurting people uh, need help. And it kind of is. We're getting there. We're getting there. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your support. And thank you for your devotion to your Lord. I, I mean, um, it's, it's a blessing. It's a blessing. And I know it blesses Him. I know it blesses Him. You know, if you've ever been a parent and your kids, when they want to spend time with you, and it's a blessing, that's how the Lord feels and then some. So let's bow our heads and pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this, for this time and this opportunity to come together, Lord. And, and uh, thank you for being a part of your family. Thank you for your, your love and your provision. Thank you for how intentional you are as a God. And that you have a plan and a purpose for everything that, that comes your way. Everything that comes our way. And Lord, we stand here, we sit here today as yielded vessels, and we give our lives to you, Lord. And whatever you want to change, change. Whatever you want to move, move. We give you permission, Lord. I pray right now, the sound of my voice, that everyone in here would just open up the depths of their heart right now. Just open it up. Just that place that you said was off limits. That place that you said you would never get hurt there again. Come on now, I'm talking to somebody. You said, I'll never get hurt that, that way again. No one will ever take advantage of me like that again. Come on, I'm speaking to somebody. You said that. You made that vow. Well, that vow is keeping the Lord out of that place. And He wants that place. He wants to be there in that place, in that deepest, dark, the, the most painful place in, in your being. He wants to be there. But He's not going to force Himself. You got to let Him in. You got to open the door. And I tell you what, I will, 
I will guarantee you, He will be gentle to you. He will be loving. He will be kind. He is respectful. He will treat you with dignity. He will bring healing to that place. He will bring restoration to that place. He will get rid of the bad things, the pain, the hurt, the bitterness, that root of bitterness come out in Jesus' name right now. Come out. Thank you. And you open, your, you open yourself to the Lord right there. You allow Him into that place. And I guarantee you will not get hurt there ever again. You let the Lord in that place and He is your defender. He is your strong tower. He is your ever-present help in trouble. He's in that place. Let Him into that place. Come on now. Open up that deep part, that hurt, that abuse, that rejection, that shame, that worst decision I ever made place. Open it up right now to the Lord. Open it up in Jesus' name. Say, come on in, Jesus. I need a deliverer. Tell him, I need a healer. I need your love. Talk to him now. I can't do it for you. I need your mercy. Come on, talk to the Lord. Come on, come. Come, pour out your spirit right now. Pour out your spirit in Jesus' mighty name. Pour it out. Pour it out in Jesus' name. Pour it out. Fill me afresh right now. Fill me afresh in Jesus' name. Come on, come on. Out in Jesus' name. Out. Let her go. Let her go. Come out. Come out right now. Pain. Pain. Go in Jesus' name. Right now. Heartache. Go. Go in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Yes, Jesus. Lord, He makes all things new. All things new, head to toe, inside and out. I pray for your joy, that joy unspeakable. I come against any, any physical hurts or pains, infirmity right now. I speak new life. Lord, your word says if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone. I speak death to the old right now in Jesus' name. I speak life to the new right now in Jesus' name. New life. New movement right now. Every ligament, every joint, every blood vessel, every artery proclaims praise. Everything will bring you praise, God. Your knees, your neck, your shoulders be aligned with Jesus right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for my sister right now. I speak that strength and that power, that anointing. That breaks the yoke. Hallelujah. Those gifts, Lord, of faith and power, that discerning of spirits right now, the working of miracles in Jesus' mighty name. Healing in Jesus' name right now. Newness right now. Right now. Jesus, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah for your power. Your glory, your provision, Lord. We praise you, God, in Jesus' name. You are good, Lord. You are good. I pray you move mightily in their family, Lord. I pray for a renewal. I pray for a softening of the hearts of the children, that they would return to their parents and to their parents to their children, Lord. I pray that you build a bridge where people said there would be no bridge, that you make that new, that you restore those relationships, Lord. Right now, in Jesus' name, I, I, I declare there's small, there's small differences in Jesus' name. They're getting smaller right now in Jesus' name. Lord, you are bigger than that. Your provision is bigger than that. Your purpose is bigger than that. What the enemy meant for evil, God meant for good so that lives will be saved this very day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Right now in Jesus' name. Break off the yoke. Break every chain. Break every chain. Break it now. Break it now. Come out. Come out. Tell it to come out. 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 Let me go. Get out right now. Out. 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 Let me go. Get out right now. Out. Say out right now. Out right now. Go in Jesus' name. Let me go right now. I am forgiven. You are trespassing. I am forgiven. You are trespassing. 
Yes, yes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Right now, Father, your will be done. Your kingdom come. Right now, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Jesus, Jesus, hallelujah. Yes, yes, Lord, power, the anointing right now, the Holy Ghost right now, move, Holy Ghost, move in Jesus' name, show yourself mighty, show yourself mighty to save, hallelujah, hallelujah, move, Holy Ghost, move in Jesus' name, whom the sun sets free is free indeed, hallelujah, it's free indeed in Jesus' name. Break it off in Jesus' name. Yes, yes, right now in Jesus' name. We break you off in Jesus' name right now. Fibromyalgia, right now, Lord. Any any of that sickness and any of that pain right now, I pray for the fire of God to come down right now and drive out every demon. Drive out every demon out of every joint, out of every every muscle right now in Jesus' name. That rejection, that accusation. Right now, go in Jesus' name. The sense of not being good enough, right now, go in Jesus' name. That self-fault-finding, self-hating, right now, come out in Jesus' name. You are beautiful and precious and holy in Jesus' name. You are chosen. You are chosen. He delights in you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Get out in Jesus' name. Get out that sickness. Let me go. Let me go in Jesus' name. Right now, I pray for forgiveness, Lord. May she know the beauty of your forgiveness. The beauty of your love. The joy that you have when you look to her. The joy that you have right now in Jesus' name. Right now, Lord, I come against anything that's ever broken her down. Any critical spirit right now that she has battled be broken off in Jesus' name from her mom or from her dad. Right now, be broken off, you critical spirit. Be broken off in Jesus' name. She is beautiful. She's wonderfully, fearfully made. She's chosen and precious. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you, Lord. Her name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life right now in Jesus' name. But, Lord, we want some of that kingdom come. Your will be done right now, Lord. I pray right now in the sound of my voice, Lord, you would send your healing touch right now. Send your warring angels. Send the power of your Holy Spirit right now in Jesus' name. Send it right now in Jesus' name. Send it right now in Jesus' name. Your healing power. Yes, Lord. Restore to her the beauty and innocence of her youth in Jesus' name. Yes, Jesus. Jesus, hallelujah. Yes, yes here it comes, Lord. Here it comes, Lord. Here it comes. The fire right now, the anointing. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. You said you would finish it, Lord. Finish it, Lord. Right now in Jesus' name. Move side to side, top to bottom. Right now in Jesus' name. Right now, in Jesus' name. Right now, hallelujah. Right now, right now, in Jesus' name. Right now, thank you. Right now, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Lord. Your will be done. Your will be done right now, Lord. Right now, Lord. Right now, for the power of the Holy Spirit, through the faith, right now, in Jesus' name. Right now, continue to move, Lord. I pray for the synopsis to fire. I pray for the nerve system to be restored in Jesus' name. To bring you glory, Lord, as you designed it right now. To function as you designed it, Lord. We believe in you, Lord. It says the prayer of faith will save the sick. And they will be forgiven. They will be restored. And you will raise her up in Jesus' mighty name. And they will be healed right now in Jesus' name. Yes, Jesus. Move in a mighty way. Continue to move, Lord. Right now, the move in Jesus' name. Move. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. 
يا رب الشكل يا بابا بر الشكل يا بابا يا رب الشكل يا بابا يا ريكل يا بابا تو 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 Get out, you blood demon. Get out. Get out. Get out. Get out. Go, 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 Get out. Get out. Go, 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 in Jesus' name. Go. Go. Thank you. Go. Go in Jesus' name. Right now. Go in Jesus' name. Go. Go, go. I was shaking a barrack of my mind. I can't shake it above. I was shaking 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 above.